the next um, the next speaker very pleased to have uh, Professor Rob Jeffries, who's a, a local uh, colleague from from Keele University, which is just down the road, just south of here. And, and Rob's going to tell us about what I think is probably uh, the most important astronomical discovery that's been made in uh, in recent decades, I would guess. And leave Rob to tell you all about gravitational waves. Okay, thank you very much. So, am I uh, audible and clear? Good. Okay, so yes, as uh, Tim said, I'm going to tell you about gravitational waves. So, many of you will be aware that in February there was this announcement of the discovery of gravitational waves. I think it's uh, arguably, in fact I would say, it's, it's the most important scientific discovery of the 21st century, uh, certainly. And, uh, well, caused a great deal of excitement, certainly on a par with things like the discovery of the Higgs boson, uh, the discovery of planets around other stars. Uh, and I'm sure it will be, uh, you know, there will be a Nobel Prize in it for, for somebody, although how are they going to choose who to give the Nobel Prize to from the thousands of authors that were on the paper announcing the discovery? I have no idea. So, uh, during the talk, I'm going to tell you, uh, or try and explain to you what gravitational waves are. Uh, tell you a bit about how they were actually uh, found, how they were actually discovered, and perhaps most importantly, what I want you to go away with is an idea of why people like me get, are getting you know, quite excited about this, uh, this discovery, why gravitational waves are so important. You'll see that it actually opens up a whole new uh, area of uh, uh, observational endeavour. Uh, in that sense, to me, it is more important than things like uh, the Higgs boson, which, which simply sort of uh, complete our understanding of a particular area of physics. Okay, well I'm going to start off uh, with this chap. I'm sure everybody knows who this is. Right, okay, this is Einstein as a, <laughs> as a young man. Uh, thought I'd try and get a bit of audience participation. <laughs> uh, obviously failed. Uh, this is Einstein as a young man. Um, so uh, in 1905, Einstein sort of shook the world, as it were, with his, uh, he had this sort of annus mirabilis where he, uh, he wrote three papers which were each individually uh, worthy of Nobel Prizes. He only got a Nobel Prize for one of them. Does anybody know what Einstein got his Nobel Prize for? Yeah, he didn't get a Nobel Prize for relativity, bizarrely enough. Um, uh, but in 1905, he uh, introduced his special theory of relativity, which changed the way that we think about space and time, have to throw common sense out of the window, uh, we have strange phenomena like moving clocks actually appear to run slow, uh, you know, lengths get contracted when things move fast. This is now, you know, this is scientific fact. We know beyond any reasonable doubt whatsoever that these ideas of special relativity are absolutely correct. And many of the things that we rely on uh, today, many of the things that have done uh, actually just assume special relativity. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about though is general relativity. General relativity was a theory that Einstein came up with afterwards. It was published in 1916, conveniently 100 years before the discovery of gravitational waves. And uh, general relativity rests on this thing called the equivalence principle. So the equivalence principle says that there really isn't any experiment that you can do in this room right now to distinguish between uh, whether you are being uh, accelerated by a gravitational field or whether in fact this entire room is accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so there is, there is this fundamental equivalence between a gravitational field uh, and an acceleration. And Einstein's genius was to kind of come up with that simple idea and then to follow it through and to see where it took him. You know, where, what is the consequence of that, uh, of that uh, simple idea? So here's Einstein in a lift. So just to repeat what I'm saying, uh, there really isn't, if you're sort of in a closed box in a lift like that, there really isn't anything that you can do to tell uh, whether that lift is being accelerated upwards or in fact whether the lift is stationary on the floor and you're being pulled down by by gravity. So uh, let's imagine that we have uh, a clock in a rocket ship. So here's the rocket on the left, on the ground, 
Uh, and what I'm going to do is uh, light the blue touch paper, and the rocket is going to launch into space. Now, we know from special relativity that uh, moving, ru moving ru rulers appear to be shorter to an observer that's uh, at rest with respect to the rocket, uh, and a clock that's on board would appear to run slower. You know, this is, as I say, this has been tested many, many times. It's definitely a, a fact. It happens. Well, of course, this must be true, then, for if an observer sees a rocket accelerate into, into the sky, well, the rocket is moving faster, so, um, you know, on board that rocket, uh, a clock that was on board that rocket would appear to be running slower. But the equivalence principle tells us that this situation is entirely analogous. The equivalence principle tells us there isn't any experiments that we could do to distinguish between that and a rocket which is simply resting on the floor, but is simply in a strong gravitational field. So a gravitational field and an, accelerate and an acceleration are equivalent. So measured lengths and time intervals depend on your location in a gravitational field. A clock, which is on the Earth, will actually run slower than a clock that's in space. Now that sounds you know, like well, it's not common sense. And relativity really you can't you can't use your common sense to understand relativity. You have to accept the basic principles and tenets behind relativity and then see where it takes you. And this is where it takes you. Now Einstein came up with this idea or these ideas and a mathematical theory uh, in nineteen sixteen, and one of the first things that he applied it to was a long-standing problem for Newtonian gravitational uh, physics. This was the uh, so-called precession of Mercury problem. So uh, when Mercury goes around the Sun, uh, it executes a, well, a, an elliptical orbit, but the ellipse does not stay with its, uh, if you like, its pointy ends in the, in the same direction. The ellipse precesses around the Sun in a, in a path that I've well, this cartoon tries to indicate there. Of course, this is vastly exaggerated. Vastly, vastly exaggerated. Uh, nevertheless, the uh, orbit of Mercury was sufficiently well uh, measured, uh, even in the 19th century, to know uh, that there was a problem between the predictions of Newtonian gravity uh, and what was observed. It turns out that general relativity exactly explains that discrepancy. So this was the first real... Uh, inkling, the first real indication that general relativity was certainly a more correct version of gravity uh, than was the, the theory of uh, Sir Isaac Newton that had been developed uh, in the centuries before that. But uh, it wasn't really until 1919 that general relativity hit the headlines. So um, on the left uh, here is, uh, sorry, who's that again? <laughs> Right, okay, so I've taught you something. <laughs> uh, this, this guy is uh, Arthur Eddington. So Eddington was a very uh, distinguished uh, uh, British scientist at the time, perhaps the foremost <coughs> astrophysicist uh, of his time in Britain. And he arranged uh, a couple of expeditions to South America and, uh, uh, and Africa to observe a total eclipse of the sun, which was occurring in May of that year. Now, the rationale for this uh, uh, cost a lot of money at the time, actually. It was, uh, I think, uh, sponsored probably by the, 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 the Royal Astronomical Society, uh, was to investigate the relative predictions of Newtonian gravity and general relativity. Because general relativity predicted uh, that the light from a star that passed close to the limb of the sun, a ray of light passing close to the, the limb of the sun, would be curved, would be bent. Now, Newtonian physics also predicts this, but the, there is a factor of two difference in the prediction. So, Einstein's theory predicted that the, the bending would be a factor of two larger than predicted by Newton. So, uh, the expedition took place, and they did these measurements of the positions of stars, behind the sun during the solar eclipse. And uh, the result was a triumph for Einstein's uh, theory. And this really was front page news 
all around the world. I, uh, I like this. I found this somewhere on the internet. It's, there. it's the front page of the New York Times from 1919, and it's, it's, it's actually probably not till 100 years later when science like this has made the front page uh, of the New York Times. And I particularly like this phrase, men of science more or less agog at the results of observations. And Einstein the Einstein's theory triumphs. Um, so uh, the star, uh, stars not where they seem to same seemed or were calculated to be, but nobody need worry. <laughs> now that's that, that's great because that leads me on to my next slide. You know, why why you know who, who cares really about whether general relativity is right or Newtonian gravity is right? You know, we seem to have managed okay uh, with Newtonian gravity. And for instance, you know, you can fly a rocket to the moon without really needing Newtonian. Uh, without needing general relativity. So, um, what, uh, what's the point? Well, um, this feature of uh, uh, Einsteinian gravity or general relativity turns out to be extremely useful for astronomers. So, for example, this bending of light is now routinely used to investigate very, very distant galaxies. Very distant galaxies might have uh, their light bent and magnified by a foreground cluster of galaxies here, uh, and that means that we can see things in more detail that are much further away. Alternatively, we can use the light from very distant objects like quasars, which are passing through a foreground uh, massive galaxy or a cluster of galaxies, to map out the distribution of matter that's in that cluster of galaxies. And for instance, this tells us about dark matter. It tells us about matter that can't be seen, but we can see the influence of it in bending and magnifying the light of background objects. So that's you know that's really fascinating for people like for people like me. That's that's really useful. Um, but what about you? Well, okay, so GPS. Uh, I guess all of you knew where Jodrell Bank uh, was, but did any of you use a GPS to get here? <laughs> Oh, okay, well, uh, the thing is, the clocks on the GPS satellites run intentionally slowly. Right? General relativity uh, causes a, a time difference, a, a difference in the rate at which clocks run in your GPS device on your car and the GPS clocks in space. And if you just ignored general relativity, you'd soon actually run into trouble. It, you know, it's a very small difference, but it's a difference that accumulates as time goes on. So. You know, these things do have uh, everyday uh, consequences. Not many, but uh, they do have everyday consequences. Okay, let's think uh, now. Start to think about gravitational waves, because gravitational waves are also a prediction of Einstein's general relativity theory. So uh, here I've got a couple of cartoons: uh, a triangle and uh, a circle. Now I'm sure you all remember back to your. Uh, <coughs> School days, no doubt. Now, <laughs> it's, it's not really a test because I, I've given you a, a big clue. But if I draw a triangle on a flat piece of paper, what do the angles of the triangle add up to? What do the interior angles add up to? Yeah, I mean, I, I, 60, 60, 60, right? It's an equilateral triangle. They add up to 180 degrees. And uh, perhaps a little bit tougher, some of you will remember, or perhaps not, that the circumference of a circle is 2 pi, 2 pi, this, this number, 3.14 or whatever, uh, 2 pi times its radius. But uh, probably what you weren't told at school, uh, this is an example of something called Euclidean geometry. This is the geometry of flat space. If you start drawing triangles and circles on curved pieces of paper, these uh, facts, which you, you may have got in, you know, seared into your brains, uh, are no longer true. Actually. So um, if I was to draw, it's obviously very difficult on a projector screen to demonstrate that, because the projector screen is flat, but I'm sure you can use your imaginations to imagine that this blue thing here is a sphere, uh, and this blue shape here might be uh, the surface of a saddle, for example. So I could draw a triangle on top of a sphere. If I do that, the angles in that triangle actually add up to more than 180 degrees. 
uh, thought experiment, if you imagine uh, the North Pole as one vertex of a triangle, and then you draw two lines down to the equator, so that you know it comes down with one line, say, in London, or towards London, but another one along a, a line of longitude, which perhaps goes through Los Angeles or San Francisco, somewhere around there. Then uh, you imagine all the way joining up to the pole, that angle, the one at the top, is more or less 90 degrees. And the two angles down at the equator, they're also 90 degrees as well. So the angles would actually add up to nearly 270 degrees. <coughs> On this saddle kind of surface, the opposite is true. The angles in a triangle add up to, to, to less than 180 degrees. So these, these rules of geometry depend on what kind of space uh, we're dealing with. Now, <coughs> Einstein's mathematical theory of general relativity, this was really what took him 10 years to sort out in between special relativity and general relativity, was the, that he worked out that all of these things can be solved by thinking of space not as some kind of fixed, uh, fixed thing fixed grid, but something that can be bent, something that can be warped. And what does the bending and warping of, of space and time is mass and energy. So massive objects or things that have got a lot of pressure, um, so stars, black holes, galaxies, actually bend space itself. They actually change the shape of space. So, they, so it's no longer true, necessarily, that the angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees, or that the circumference of a circle is 2 pi times its radius. And there's this very famous equation, or set of equations, actually. Um, these are called the, it's called the Einstein field equation. And it basically expresses, in a very mathematically <coughs> elegant way, this relationship between uh, the curvature of space and the amount of mass and energy that is in that space. Now, this is an extremely, mathematically, this is incredibly difficult uh, theory to, uh, to master. Uh, in fact, this equation is only solvable in, in certain very symmetric, neat, approximate cases. Uh, and the reason for that is actually relatively easy to understand, though. It's that curved space-time tells things how to move, but the stuff in space itself tells space how to curve. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg kind of problem. Uh, and to come up with some sort of self-consistent solution is very difficult. But uh, actually very soon after Einstein published his uh, theory, certain very simple symmetric cases were solved. And the most famous of these is the so-called Schwarzschild solution or the Schwarzschild metric which deals with spherically symmetric objects. Now, that's a very simple approximation, but it actually is a very good approximation for many objects in the universe. Stars, black holes, things like that. They are, roughly, spherically symmetric objects. So in that case, we, we can develop a picture, an intuitive picture, of how space is curved in the vicinity of one of these spherically symmetric objects. Now, uh, over in the visitor centre, uh, I assume it's still there, Tim. Or... There is actually a funnel <laughs> which is meant to demonstrate this, so I recommend you after this talk you all go and roll the balls around this funnel because uh, that, that is exactly what I'm trying to uh, illustrate here. Just been playing uh, with it. Yeah. That's there. So uh, <laughs> we can imagine an object um, in orbit uh, around a star as essentially an object rolling about on a funnel. So the funnel is meant to represent the gravitational uh, influence of the, mass, the more massive object. And you can imagine a ball rolling around on that. Ignore friction, right? Obviously, in the uh, thing in the visitor center, it like, drops, into the, drops into the hole in the middle because friction slows it down. If there were no friction, you could just have something rolling around on this surface uh, ad infinitum. And that's how we can consider uh, you know, an orbit of a planet around a star. Sometimes the space-time curvature gets so extreme that you know, this funnel drops away 
to infinity, and that's, that's actually what we call a black hole, the singularity at the centre of a black hole. But now, really, we're getting to the meat of this thing, because now if we imagine uh, 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 two objects orbiting each other, because, of course, it's not true to say a, a planet orbits a star, they actually both orbit their common centre of mass, which is usually very close to the centre of the star, but uh, nevertheless, that's a distinction that's important. So the two objects orbit their common centre of mass. If this secondary object had a significant mass, you can imagine that rather than it being a nice, neat funnel, there would actually be a dimple in the funnel where the secondary object was. And that dimple would follow this object around as it went around in its orbit. That results in a ripple in space-time which propagates outwards at the speed of light and gradually gets weaker and weaker as it moves away uh, from, the, from, the, uh, from the binary system. That is a gravitational wave. That is what the gravitational wave is. Or it's a very simple uh, analogy which enables you to understand basically what a gravitational wave is. Uh, you can see lots of uh, things on the internet, lots of animations which claim to show uh, show this uh, phenomenon. Here's a, this is a, again, this is the sort of rubber sheet uh, analogy. You have to imagine that there's some sort of binary system right in the middle of this animation, and you get this idea of ripples propagating outwards into space, which gradually diminish in strength as they get further away. This is actually not really what a gravitational wave looks like. This is more like uh, a radio wave, actually. We're just talking about radio waves. This is more like a radio wave, a transverse electromagnetic wave. A better illustration of what a gravitational wave looks like <coughs> is this. So it's more like cosmic peristalsis. <laughs> um, we imagine, if you imagine um, a ring, I might have to play that again, actually. Uh, a ring of, of free floating masses, they will be uh, compressed and elongated in different directions in a rhythmic way as the gravitational wave passes through. And that's what that animation is supposed to show. Uh, in a reasonable way, it's not bad. And uh, you can see the wave pattern going along. But this oscillation backwards and forwards like this, this is what gravitational wave detectors detect. OK, now, uh, back to the 1970s. We knew, well, we knew, everybody assumed that gravitational waves did exist. So Einstein predicted them, but there was no way of detecting them. Until, in the 1970s, uh, a particular pulsar was discovered, a binary system containing a pulsar. It's the so-called Hulse-Taylor uh, binary system. And the thing about this was that you can measure its orbital period extremely accurately. It's, it's seven and three-quarter hours, plus a few more decimal places. The interesting thing was, you could clearly see that this orbit was getting shorter. So these two neutron stars that form this pulsar binary system were getting closer and closer together. They were performing something that we now call an in-spiral. So the two objects are spiraling closer and closer together. Now, why is this? Well, the reason is that they're emitting gravitational waves... And those gravitational waves take away energy, and that energy comes from the orbit of the binary system. As the binary system orbit loses energy, the two stars get closer together. They actually start to move faster and faster. And, well, in about 300 million years, those two objects will collide. They'll, they'll, they'll crash together. The actual rate of decrease of this orbital period is exactly the prediction of, of what general relativity predicts would happen if 
gravitational waves were being emitted by this system. So this was a Nobel Prize winning discovery for the indirect detection of gravitational waves. So we're not detecting the gravitational waves, we're detecting the consequence of those gravitational waves being emitted. Okay, uh, I apologise in advance. Stephen Hawking, isn't it, who says every time you write an equation, you halve your readership. Or whatever. <laughs> uh, there's two here, so three quarters of you have now gone to sleep. <laughs> the, the, the only thing I want to really get across to you is what the, what the power emitted in gravitational waves depends on. And overwhelmingly, it depends on two things. It depends on how massive the objects are that are orbiting each other. And it depends on how close together they are. That's what this R is down here, the binary separation. So if you have large masses and close separations, you get lots of gravitational waves. Now this explains why you don't see very many much gravitational waves from, say, well, you might think, why doesn't the Earth spiral into the sun? It turns out when you use this equation, you only get 200 watts out of that. So, same as a fairly bright, old-fashioned light bulb, right? 200 watts. That's all the Earth-Sun system is losing in gravitational waves. So, that doesn't really make much difference to the Earth's orbit on any sensible time scale. If I go back to this pulse, pulse, uh, Taylor pulsar, this was emitting about a tenth of a solar luminosity in gravitational waves. So, it's, it's a much bigger effect. And that's because neutron stars and black holes can get much closer together than, say, the Earth and the Sun. Or even two normal stars can't really get that close together. These can get very close together. And that's why they are gravitational wave sources. OK, so what happens is this. If we have, say, two black holes or two neutron stars, and they start emitting, they're emitting gravitational waves, the orbit gets closer and closer together, they spiral closer and closer together. They emit even more gravitational waves because they're getting closer together. So that process accelerates and accelerates and accelerates <coughs> until they merge. At the same time, the gravitational waves that are being emitted go to higher and higher frequencies because the wave frequency is related to the orbital frequency of the binary system. So what you end up with is something... Uh, called a chirp. Now, I'm going to play you some chirps because it turns out that the gravitational waves that are being detected actually are in the, are actually roughly in the audible part of the spectrum in terms of their frequencies. So, what's really nice about gravitational waves is that you can, you can listen to them, you can turn them into an audible signal. So, that's what I'm going to do. So, this is two equal mass uh, black holes. Uh, spiraling together and then merging. Right, you have to listen quite carefully. Oh, you might, might want to turn it down. <laughs> yeah, that's loud enough, isn't it? Right, so that's two equal mass, about ten solar mass black holes spiraling together. Play that again. So you see why it's called a chirp? You, think you, might, you might want to actually just turn that down a bit. That might be a bit bit penetrating for some people. Uh, if, um, if it's not two equal mass black holes, it gets even more exciting. So this, this is a pair of black holes, one's ten solar masses, I think, I think the other one is about three solar masses. theoretical predictions, I should say. So, uh, back to our picture of what these gravitational waves look like, how are we actually going to go and, go and detect them? I mean, the problem is here, right, so this is now looking sort of end-on at gravitational waves. It turns out gravitational waves come in two polarization states. There's, there's kind of two, two flavors of gravitational waves. There are those that 
distort space like that. And then there's this one, which is more of a sort of cross pattern. And they are called plus polarization and cross polarization. That's what they're known as. Now, if these waves uh, pass through this room, what it means is that the space inside this room sort of wobbles. It actually gets bigger and smaller on the frequency of the gravitational waves. The difficulty is, right, these, these ones that I'm showing you here have an amplitude of, a relative amplitude of 0.5. In other words, they're getting, uh, you know, twice, two times as long than half, two times half. This has got an amplitude of a half. The gravitational wave signatures that you expect from things like merging black holes out there in the universe is 10 to the power of minus 21. So one part in a one with 21 zeros after it. That's why it's difficult to detect gravitational waves. <laughs> this is the machine that's done it, or one of the machines that's done it. There are two detectors, uh, gravitational wave detectors, one in uh, Washington State, one in Lu Louisiana, so several thousand kilometers uh, apart. These are vacuum tubes, four kilometers long, along which lasers are shot. The lasers bounce off mirrors, suspended on very sophisticated pendulums at each end of these arms. The light comes back. Actually, the light has bounced back quite a lot, backwards and forwards, to give you a long path length inside uh, these tubes. Now, they're at right angles. If a gravitational wave uh, passes through um, this apparatus, going through the screen here, what happens is, periodically, at the frequency of the gravitational wave, this arm will get shorter, whilst this arm will get longer. And then they swap over. Now, if you shine the light from a laser, split it up and send some down each arm, then bring it back together again, under ordinary circumstances, that light would uh, perhaps constructively interfere. So you would actually get twice the amplitude uh, as, as you would from down each arm. On the other hand, if there's a phase difference between the two uh, waves, if, 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 the, if, the, if, the, um, if the path lengths are different by half a wavelength, then those waves, when you recombine them, will destructively interfere. They'll completely cancel out. Now, what happens when a gravitational wave comes through is that phase difference, that path length difference, varies. It changes on the frequency of the gravitational wave. <coughs> and that means you get a, a changing signal in the recombined beam. And that is what is actually detected in the gravitational wave detector. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, the rate at which the uh, amplitude of the recombined beam is changing. That tells you the amplitude of the wave and it tells you its frequency. So you get two pieces of information there. Because there are two detectors separated by thousands of kilometers, you also get another piece of information. You get roughly to know where the gravitational wave came from. Because gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. So there is a measurable time delay between the signals received by the two detectors. The detectors are also think about putting them on the surface of the Earth, they've got a slightly different orientation in space. That means the gravitational wave signals will have slightly different amplitudes. <coughs> right? The orientation with respect to the wave actually matters. So there is some crude location property here. You can actually um, tell where it's coming from to a limited extent. Now, this rather technical diagram explains why gravitational waves have just been discovered, why, you know, why it's uh, uh, suddenly happened. This is a plot of sensitivity, it doesn't really matter what the units are, uh, but sensitivity here on the y-axis against frequency in hertz. So we hear between, I don't know, 20 hertz and um, 10 kilohertz maybe, depends actually, it's very age dependent, uh, the, the upper frequency that you can hear. So you can see that uh, advanced LIGO, which is this orange curve, is actually most sensitive, this is where the graph goes into its minimum, it's most sensitive at audible frequencies. 
Uh, and the big step here was to go from LIGO, the blue curve, to advanced LIGO, the orange curve. And they're not actually all the way to this orange curve yet. There's another factor of two sensitivity to come in various developments that they're making to this machine. And, you know, the reasons for this advance in sensitivity are things like much more powerful lasers uh, and also uh, much cleverer ways to deal with, well, you can imagine, seismic noise, right? So if somebody drops a spanner, even if it's a mile away, they're going to hear that with this detector. It's going to shake the detector enough. This is why they have to evacuate the, this four kilometer tube and make it a high vacuum. Because molecules of gas bouncing off the mirrors is a big problem. They don't want, they don't want that. Um, similarly, these, the, 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 the mirrors at the end of the tubes are mounted on not just one pendulum, it's actually four pendulums suspended from each other. And then the mount of that is, has got both passive and active damping of any seismic noise. So they have seismic detectors which put in an anti-signal, a bit like noise-cancelling headphones, to actually try and take out uh, seismic motion. Um, it's, it's the most incredible work of technology. So at this end of the frequency spectrum, at the low frequency end, seismic noise um, kills the detector, kills the sensitivity. At the other end, we get something called shock noise. This is because you, you, there basically isn't enough power in your laser to follow very rapidly changing frequencies uh, of gravitational waves. So there's a sweet spot. There's a sweet spot in the middle, and it just happens to be at rather low audible frequencies. So here we are. We arrive at uh, February. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the, the gravitational wave was detected in uh, September of uh, 2015 and announced in February. So this is the, uh, the signal. This is the raw signal from uh, two detectors. Right? They've got one in Washington, one in Louisiana. The fact that these signals look the same is, is you know, this is one of the criteria for deciding that this is actually a genuine detection, right? It's not just somebody dropping a spanner because you would hear that in one detector but not the one that's sat thousands of kilometres away. That's an important part of the, of the checking procedure. From this signal, you can work out that this came from the merger of two black holes one of them was 36 solar masses, one of them was 29 solar masses. They merged over the course of, some of you might be able to see the time axis here, is a fraction of a second here. This signal occurred over a fraction of a second. So they merged in a fraction of a second to produce a 62 solar mass black hole. Now, uh, this is again, it's not a test, but those of you with quick arithmetic skills should be able to see that there's uh, something, something awry there, isn't there? 36 plus 29 gives 65. The final black hole was 62. Where is the missing three solar masses? Right, it's been converted into gravitational wave energy. That's what we're detecting. Three solar masses being converted into energy in a fraction of a second. If you do the sums, it turns out that this gravitational wave event is more luminous than the entire universe for that fraction of a second. This is, one of the, this is the most energetic event uh, that's been seen. The source was estimated to be 1.3 million light years away. You get all that information from this horrible squiggly trace here. Right, right I'm going uh, to play you this, the, the, the signature. I hope. Uh, well, let me just play this first. So this is an, an artist's, or well, not, not an artist's impression. This is a calculation of what this might look like if you were a few hundred kilometres away from these black holes. If you were actually able to look at it with your own eyes, this is what it would look like. Can you see how the, the light is distorted? Right. This is the gravitational lensing effect that I talked about earlier on. So you've got the two black holes there spinning close and there they go. They merge into one black hole. Okay, so let me uh, let me actually play the signal for you. 
output in here. Okay, so this is a different uh, way of looking at the data. So this is frequency on the y-axis. This is frequency against time. And this is showing you where the signal is. So this rising and brightening signal here is a chirp. That's what a chirp is. And then the chirp has been made audible for you. That's what you're, that's what you're hearing. So that little whoop, that's, you know, the most energetic event in the universe. <laughs> it's kind of humbling, really, but, but there you go. So this, this, these are the chirps. Okay, now, that was the first event. There is now a second detection. So, uh, in, uh, well, it was actually detected on Boxing Day, 2015. Uh, announced in June, I think. Uh, this was a much less impressive uh, detection, right? So a bit a noisier detection, but a detection nonetheless. And the reason that it was um, a bit more noisy is because this, the pair of black holes was not as massive. Do you remember I said that the power that's emitted depends on how massive the orbiting objects are? So this was uh, a source which is about the same distance away, 1.4 million light years, but the two black holes were not, were not as massive. So uh, what this tells us is that we have a population of these things. There is actually a population of merging black holes out there. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, some numbers have been put on that now. Uh, so th these are black holes that we know about. So this bunch over here, which are actually now we have to say a relatively low mass black holes between about 5 and five and 20 solar masses. These were discovered by X-ray satellites indirectly. So actually looking at the influence that these black holes had on binary <laughs> companions. These big monsters here are the black holes that have been discovered by uh, LIGO, this gravitational wave detector. And these are uh, fairly monster black holes that we didn't actually know existed before LIGO de detected them. So very direct evidence of these black holes. And in fact, uh, we now know, uh, still, still quite a wide range, but we now know that there's about something like a hundred of these events take place every year in a queue which is a billion parsecs on a side. Right. About a about hundred of these things happen. And uh, my guess is now that, that LIGO will go on to detect many of these events, many of these events, and build up uh, a real, this, this diagram will get populated uh, over the coming years. So there is still more to come. I mentioned that earlier on. So at the moment, LIGO is operating with a sensitivity curve given by this, this red, this red curve here. Its design specification is to get down to this blue curve. So it's supposed to be get about a factor of two more sensitive than it is now. Uh, now, if it gets a factor of two more sensitive, it actually samples a factor of two cubed more volume. It's capable of detecting gravitational waves a factor of two further away, which means a factor of two cubed in volume. So you're going to get ten times or eight times the event rate that they're discovering now. So whereas they might discover, say, two of these events in a three-month run of the instrument, um, when they get down to this sensitivity, they'll be detecting, well, you know, 16 events in a three-month run. So gravitational wave astronomy is here. Now, it's not just merging black holes which might be sources of gravitational waves. Uh, and when these improved sensitivities are achieved, it may be that we start to detect some different kinds of gravitational wave uh, signature. So uh, I've got some sounds again to play for you. So one possible source of gravitational waves would be a rapidly spinning neutron star. So Tim told you about general band conservations of pulsars, which are rapidly rotating uh, neutron stars. Uh, and these rotate with frequencies of, well, uh, somewhere between uh, maybe one and a thousand hertz. So again, it's actually into the audible uh, regime. Importantly, an absolutely spherically symmetric spinning neutron star would give no gravitational waves at all. 
you need an asymmetry. You need an asymmetry. There needs to be some sort of off-center uh, component to the density in the, in the neutron star to, to come up with a uh, gravitational wave signature. But if that's the case, then it might sound something like this. So it's just a tone, which is given by the spin frequency of, of the pulsar. Uh, as neutron cells pulsars spin down, that tone would actually drop to lower frequencies. Another source of gravitational waves would be uh, what's thought to be quite a rare event, but sometimes black holes swallow a companion star. So uh, I've got a couple of sound files here, which are simulations of what um, a black hole swallowing a star uh, might sound like. So you, you've got to listen carefully to this. These are not very noisy events, because rather than two black holes now, we've got a black hole and a normal star. So this is a 10 solar mass black hole swallowing a star. Sounds like an apocalyptic event, right? <laughs> <laughs> But interestingly, if I make it a 20 solar mass black hole, <laughs> now you could you can do gravitational wave astronomy, can't you? Because you could tell the difference between that, those two things, can you? 10 solar mass black holes following a star, 20 solar mass. Obvious difference, isn't it? This is the power of gravitational wave astronomy. We wouldn't necessarily see this event happening, but we we'd hear it with a gravitational wave detector. Supernova explosions. These are huge, cosmic, apocalyptic events. Uh, the deaths of very massive stars. So we expect these to be sources of gravitational waves. Uh, again, you might have thought, well, oof, this is probably going to be quite impressive. So this is a supernova explosion occurring uh, perhaps in one of, the, one of the nearby galaxies to our own. <laughs> Play that for you, play that for you again, in case you missed it. Sort of a dull thud, basically. That's a supernova going on. Uh, why is that important? Well, we actually don't get to see supernova going off. We see the aftermath. A supernova is the collapse of the core of a massive star, but it's surrounded by this huge envelope of gas uh, outside the actual massive star, which gets blown off as a supernova. But the supernova event itself is initiated by that core collapse. And it's the core collapse you could hear there, not the right explosion that occurs later. There's an awful lot of physics to be learned if we knew what the time delay was, what the difference was between when the core actually collapses and when we see the explosion uh, as a supernova. So that moves me on really to sort of the end part of this talk, which is really trying to convey to you why, why you know, other than making nice ringtones, uh, why <laughs> gravitational wave astronomy is at all uh, important. So the point is it opens up a fourth observational window. So if you think about how we observe the universe, obviously you can see stars, you can, you can look at them, you can actually get the electromagnetic radiation, obviously at different wavelengths, radio waves, visible waves, x-rays, but the electromagnetic spectrum. So you can look at uh, stars like that. You can uh, fly out there and try and grab something. Right? Now, obviously, that's possible in the solar system. You know, we can go to the moon and we can pick up some moon rocks and bring it back. A third way is, is particles from outer space. So there are now you know, cosmic ray astronomy is a well-developed field of astronomy as is neutrino astronomy. Neutrinos are particles which are emitted, for, for example, in nuclear reactions in the cores of stars. We can then detect them. Uh, they're emitted in supernovae. So neutrino astronomy is a third uh, way of observing the universe. Gravitational waves are now a fourth way, fourth way of looking at things. It opens up a whole new window <coughs> on the universe. This is what we mean by uh, multi-messenger astronomy. Right? So that example I gave you of observing a supernova if we could observe a supernova in a nearby galaxy and detect a gravitational wave signature, a burst of neutrinos, and then the, the optical light, the electromagnetic signature, sometime later, we would be in a position to solve all sorts of problems in fundamental physics and, uh, and astrophysics. 
Uh, testing gravity. You know, these gravitational waves are a, uh, a consequence of Einstein's general theory of relativity. But general relativity is not the only game in town. There are other relativistically compatible theories of how gravity works, which can be tested using gravitational waves. So that example of merging black holes, producing a single black hole at the end, well, that exact uh, trace, that the exact gravitational wave signature of that process, is uh, testing general relativity. So uh, we need more accurate data than we've got at the moment to provide a very stringent test of general relativity, but it, it looks like that's going to be possible. Right, so uh, comparing general relativity against competing theories. And then finally, I'll leave you with sort of one speculative one, uh, which is that at the moment, if we look at the universe with electromagnetic waves, we are limited to how far back we can see. Tim mentioned this in his talk. He talked about the cosmic microwave background. So the cosmic microwave background was formed a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. Prior to that, the universe was opaque to electromagnetic radiation. So it's a bit like looking into a fog bank. We can't actually see beyond the fog bank. Gravitational waves are, uh, find normal matter almost transparent. You know, they pass through the, work, through the Earth unimpeded apart from the tiny fraction of their energy which is absorbed by a gravitational wave detector. Um, similarly, uh, gravitational waves can pass through the early universe uh, with impunity. Now, we think that in the very earliest fractions of a second of the Big Bang, that gravitational waves were copiously produced by various mechanisms. Those gravitational waves are still out there. They're still in the universe now, filling the universe, sloshing about with a sort of stochastic background noise, analogous to the, to the cosmic microwave background, but a, a, a gravitational wave background. If we can detect that, then potentially it gives us information, far more information actually, than the cosmic microwave background itself. It allows us to see right back to the earliest moments of the universe and start to probe uh, things like uh, cosmic inflation theory, for example. Uh, I've got a, well, these waves are expected to be at much lower frequencies than the waves I've been talking about. white noise, more like a white noise, but patterns in that white noise and the spatial distribution of that white noise is extremely important and extremely diagnostic of process in the uh, early universe. But as I say, this is at low frequencies, not at the frequencies I've been talking about. To detect gravitational waves at low frequencies, you need to do something different. Remember that LIGO, this gravitational wave detector in the US, was limited by uh, seismic noise. To get away from seismic noise, you need to go into space. So there are proposals, it's on the drawing board, something called uh, LISA, or rather ELISA now, right? it's, it's, it's a European, uh, uh, European proposal for a gravitational wave detector in space, which will consist of uh, three free-floating flyers situated, uh, well, about five million kilometers apart. And this very long arm length is what you need to detect low frequency <coughs> gravitational waves. Low frequency gravitational waves that might come from the early universe. Low frequency gravitational waves that might come from, say, <coughs> supermassive black holes colliding in the midst of uh, forming galaxies at very high red shifts in the distant past. So I'm going to leave you with that and say that gravitational wave astronomy has been born. Uh, there are now detections of gravitational wave uh, sources for us to try and understand. It looks like there's a population of gravitational wave sources out there to be discovered, and therefore it's opened up a completely new window on the universe. It's kind of increased our observational capacity by a quarter, if you like. It's a, it's a, it's a fourth way of looking at the universe. And there's going to be a, just a whole lot of new, exciting discoveries about the most energetic events in the universe, 
and also the things which are the hardest to see you know, using conventional telescopes. You can't see merging black holes with a conventional telescope. They're black. You can't see them. Uh, and so there's going to be lots of exciting stuff to come in the next uh, few years. So just watch this space, and I'll, uh, I'll try and answer your questions if you have any. Thanks. Take one at the back there, that's where you are in the compass. Are gravitational waves redshift? Uh, yes, they are. They, they, uh, so the source at 1.3 million light years away uh, did have a redshift. I'm busy while I'm talking trying to calculate what that would be in my head. I think it's a redshift of 0 0.04. So that means that the, uh, yeah, the waves are, are set to a, a frequency that's about 4% lower. Uh, than it would be if you were sort of right next to the source. That's right. Interestingly, the distances that are derived to gravitational wave sources are independent of, of any measurement of the redshift. So you get the distance without having to measure that redshift. Uh, in fact, these merging black hole binaries have sometimes been called standard sirens in analogy to standard candles in optical astronomy. So uh, when you measure uh, emerging black hole binary, you get its distance for free, actually. That's one of the things that comes out of the analysis. But they, they, they are redshifted, yeah. When the two black holes were merging, uh, you say that the, uh, the gravitational waves increase. Yeah, they increase in amplitude and in frequency, yeah. When the two are actually merging between one and the other, do you still get gravitational waves from them? And can you detect them differently? Right, so if you, uh, if you watched, um, well, let me just uh, I guess I can show you on this one. You can actually see at the end phase here, so the black holes have merged about here, where my laser spot is. And there's actually what's called a ring down phase. So the two black holes merge into a single black hole, and that sort of kind of wobbles itself into an equilibrium configuration. But once it's in that equilibrium configuration, it has complete symmetry. And, at that, and at, at that point, you don't get any more gravitational waves. So even, even if it's spinning, uh, that, that doesn't matter. You, you wouldn't get any gravitational waves after that initial ring down phase. But this, this ring down phase is extremely important for testing theories of strong gravity. Yeah. I went to a talk in South Africa. Swansea about 10 days ago, and the thing I took away from that was that the maximum power output for the first event that they detected was 4 times 10 to the 49 watts. Yes. To put that in perspective, the age of the universe in seconds is only about 4 times 10 to the 17 seconds. Yes. So the age of the universe in seconds is yeah. huge, roughly. Yeah. Yeah. If you average it over the first second, uh, over a second or so, it's about 10 to the 48 watts. And if you work that out in solar luminosities, it's roughly 10 to the 22 solar luminosities, and there are about 10 to the 22 stars in the observable universe. So that's the source of my claim that this is as powerful as all the stars in the universe, all at once, for that, for that second, yeah. Cool. Um, you were talking about the two uh, supermassive black holes merging, and, and they did it incredibly quickly. Yeah. But presumably, because they're in a gravity well, they're actually doing it much faster than we are observing. Is that right? Uh, yes, yes. All those effects of time dilation and so on have to uh, all have to be in, incorporated. Yeah. It's very difficult. It's it's a very difficult calculation to 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 make the the predicted signals that you match against the data. It's a it's a it's a, actually a fearsome computational problem. It's not something you can do with pencil and paper. Uh, it is a, you know, numerical general relativity is a is now a burgeoning uh, industry, should I say, as a result of these uh, uh, these gravitational wave detectors, and all those things have to be taken into account. Um, does that have any effect on the propagation of the gravitational waves close uh, to the the new black or the? Yes, it does. Yes, the, yeah. yes, and all that has to be yeah. yes, all that has to be part of the calculation. Thank you. Yeah. 
But when you've got the two objects overseeing each other, yeah. and then at the dimple that makes the wave, yeah. what is this about the supernova that actually makes the oh, gravitational? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so so uh, the fundamental thing about something that produces gravitational waves is you have to have an asymmetry. Right? You can't have something that's spherically symmetric, or even something that's axially symmetric, so just something spinning on its axis won't produce gravitational waves but there needs to be some asymmetry. Now, in supernovae, uh, it, it is normally expected that there will be an asymmetry in the explosion. Uh, why that is, is uh, a little bit complicated, but it's to do with how, how uh, flames are ignited in collapse. There's, there's, there's a kind of random nature to where, where the kind of explosion begins. Now, we know that supernovae explosions are asymmetric, because very frequently we see uh, massive stars that presumably were part of binary systems where one of the objects has gone supernova and the other star is flying off in some other direction somewhere. So we know that, that supernova explosions are intrinsically asymmetric. So we expect to be able to observe the gravitational wave signatures of supernovae if they occur in relatively nearby galaxies. Right? So Supernovae uh, explosions are much weaker sources of gravitational wave energy than these merging binary black holes. I think, I think probably we're going to have to leave it there because we've uh, got, got to have our lunch. But let's thank Rob again for a brilliant talk. Uh,